We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. That's right. Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio. This is 135 B-Side, the uh, recorded Friday, December 9th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I still have my usual suspects. I've got Stephen Griffith and Daniel Atherton, and we're going to break down some science now. All right, so, <clears throat> Japan tests magic, magnetic space cleaner? Yes. Um, what the what? Japan, <laughs> yes. Um, we got this up from uh, the BBC, and they have just launched a cargo ship that will use a half mile long tether um, to remove vast amounts of space debris from Earth's orbit. Um, it was huh. the device was made with the help of a fishing net company. Um, current runs through it, and it is to try and accumulate all the, the, the lovely objects that are in Earth orbit. The tether made of aluminum strands and steel wire is designed to slow the debris, pulling it out of orbit. Huh. Huh. It is called the stork, or the konotori in Japanese. Uh, and it, it, it is the junk collector, uh, it's, it is bound for the International Space Station, um, and the electrodynamic tether will generate enough energy to change an object's orbit, pushing it towards the atmosphere where it will burn up. You know, huh. you slow it down to a certain point and gravity will take over from there. Yeah, gravity does its thing. So, huh. I'm, huh, interesting. So the net company is 106 years old. They they mentioned that several times. Um, Again, if, it, if it's old and not busted, huh. might as well use the technology. Yeah. Why haven't we heard about this from Sooner? NASA? No, just from NASA at all. I have no idea. I'm going to go with uh, they've cut the crap out of the budget for NASA. Well, not yet. They're focused on other things. They haven't yet. I mean, but but they, also they this do is an, a, a keep international track. thing. This is not not a domestic thing. Okay, so this is this is also just in test. But when it comes to space, all of the space agencies talk to each other. Yeah, especially when you're going to be saying. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to make sure that all the all the debris that is currently in in Earth orbit uh, comes down. That's the kind of thing that other nations need to know because now, it could come yeah. down on them. Now, most of, of that... most of this, prop nearly all, maybe all, will burn up. Yeah. Now, one of the things that they say is that the tether is designed primarily for large hunks of space junk. It will not work on the small ones. Um, and that there is significant financial benefits to this technology should it work, which is clearing space for more, sp more satellites and lowering the risk of damage. Yeah. Yeah, I... Um... I agree entirely. Collisions between satellites and the testing of anti-satellite weapons have made the problem worse. <laughs> yeah, there was a... Um, the, the movie Gravity uh, took into account a possible scenario where 
one satellite hits another satellite, breaking it into other pieces, and all of those pieces end up breaking into more pieces as they hit further satellites in this like perfect storm scenario, which is a mathematical model that exists. So the scenario that happened in the movie Gravity is plausible. Just yep. to give the movie a little bit, a little bit of do, uh, they did check it out. So uh, what we're seeing currently on our screen here is an image of an artist depiction of all the space debris around Earth, and it is based on the actual tracking of all of it, which we do. We do actively track all of it. So like everything over the size of a golf ball. Yeah, it's it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. I mean, people also forget that you know when they go EVA and everything else, they're being hit by micro particles and micro objects, and essentially, it's a lot of their spacesuit is yeah dealing with radiation, dealing with pressure, dealing with everything else. But it's also layers and layers and layers of Kevlar because they are essentially being shot by bullets constantly. Or at least they could. They could be shot constantly. There are some there are some great images of uh, some of the the shuttle tiles that you know that came back because all those you know they'd pop off the ceramic tile and you know examine all of them and you know make sure that the space frame the titanium space frame underneath it was all completely intact and everything and yeah there were a lot of little micro meteorite um, depressions <laughs> yeah. Heavy depressions. That was another reason why the uh, why the shuttle also always flew upside down with its cargo bay towards Earth, so that all of the heat shield also was exposed to things that were coming in. So, you know, fun stuff. Fun stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, okay, so this is interesting. We will have to keep track of that one, because that's interesting. Japan using very old technology with new materials and getting shit done. Yes. Yeah. So, um, speaking of Earth science, something that uh, that NASA has been doing very well at, uh, and is now going to have its budget nearly completely Slashed. cut for, um, like mandated. No, stop that. You're not allowed to look at the planet anymore. Uh Arctic and Antarctic sea ice reaches record lows after section the size of India melts. Am I yes. going to need to get out more charts, you that, know, to show, that, like, how big India is? Actually getting a, a accurate map uh, to relative size to the U.S., of the Indian subcontinent would be lovely, uh, considering that it's hard. <laughs> this is hard for people to wrap their heads around, yeah. um, because people don't understand the true size of the Indian subcontinent. It's called the subcontinent for a reason. It's a a, a gigantic landmass. Uh, well, let's see. If you take it. And put it somewhere in the Midwest. The left side of India stretches all the way to Oregon. The right side of India, where you have Bangladesh near all that, stretches to Wisconsin and into the Canadian border. The southern tip of India goes into Mexico near uh, Ciudad or Began. And well, the here's, here's what I found. North section of India goes past Calgary, Canada. Yeah. Because most maps of go. the U.S. are not quite accurate. Um, we actually yeah. inflate our nation. Um, yeah, not funny. as much as we inflate Europe, which is tiny. Um, yeah, down that's... With the Mercator map. Down with the Mercator map. Yeah, because it also shrinks Africa uh, a lot. way too much. A lot. And, yeah. and inflates Greenland. Um, yeah. So... No, the, but, but India's the, big. Yes, and a a chunk of of sea ice, not not actual like land, ice, which helps keep the planet cool because of the melting. change in albedo. 
um, it's melting. It's going away. That water goes somewhere, folks. It's going into the ocean, which I know this might be going back to high school science, but there's this thing called salinity. It's why the ocean is salty. And all that life that lives in the ocean is adapted to that level of saltiness. You add all that water back, it's going to change the salinity, which is going to affect the life cycles of everything in the world's oceans, let alone increase how high the ocean is. And beyond that, you also change uh, the evaporation point of the water. You change the buoyancy of the water, which right, greatly affects um, what's the one we for here? Uh, the actual ocean flows. Yeah. Which is the ocean the reason currents, why yeah. England doesn't freeze itself into a solid state come winter. It's because of the Gulf Stream. <laughs> because lots of warm water comes from the equator and hits there. As much as I dislike the movie, certain parts of the day after tomorrow was correct. The fact of, yeah, if you dump all of that ice, like, if all of that thing melts, and all that, and the salinity changes that massively, you will stop the Gulf Stream and several other major, you know... Natural weather patterns like and the things that make life livable on this little blue ball. You, however, will not be chased by some kind of... Instantaneously, you don't have to worry about that, I don't think. <laughs> um, but, no... The year is on track to be the warmest on record again. Okay. The temperatures just keep going up. Here's here's the thing. <laughs> uh, there are some really crazy things going on, said Mark Cerisi, director of the U.S. National Snow and Ice Data Center, another agency that I did not know existed, U.S. National Snow and Ice Data Center, in Boulder, Colorado. Nice place for it saying temperatures in parts of the Arctic were 20 degrees Celsius above normal some days in November. Yeah. 20 degrees. That's, that's more than 36 degrees Fahrenheit, which, by the way, let's see. So minus 32 Fahrenheit is the freezing point of, of water. You know, the Fahrenheit and Celsius scale meet at negative 40. But zero Celsius is freezing. Yeah. 100 Celsius is boiling. You know, it's based on water, because why not? So, given that we're talking about ice, temperature kind of matters. And Celsius is good enough to do that with. So, in yeah. a frozen... Would you be concerned if your freezer suddenly, you know, for some days during November, you know, when you're getting ready for you know Thanksgiving and things like that, uh, if if suddenly your freezer was twenty degrees warmer, Celsius, yeah, that would kind of ruin dinner. Um, also, just a, just as a point of of interest to me, um, most refrigerators and uh, air conditioners in general are, unless they are specifically designed to do it, they're only capable of bringing the temperature down about 30 degrees from ambient outside the box. And that's also about the temperature that it was hotter in the Arctic. Yeah. This is bad, folks. This is bad. Uh, worse news. Catastrophically bad. Worse news. We can't do anything about it anymore. This is the new future. We've already passed the point. I mean, I, they can go ahead and say, could start uncontrollable global climate change. I would like to see them come up with an answer on how they're going to freeze all that ice again. Well, see, what we have to do is we have to start mining Haley's Comet. Oh, right. We're not going to use the Futurama solution. Haley's um, Comet's not that big. I mean, it's, it's big enough to give us a world of hurt if it hits us, but it doesn't have that much water. No, it it's it's kinetic energy. The, that's the problem. The, 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 again, the reason why all of our weather is wonky is because 
of global warming, of mm-hmm. climate change. And the it's thing a thing that Trump system. continues to deny, and the guy that he's picked for the to head the EPA has denied the entire time that he has been in the private sector. Um, this is cataclysmically bad. This is also a this is a national security problem. I I, I yeah. keep coming to that. It is. Because the Pentagon believes that that's on all their records too. Yeah, this is the, the, this is not just an environmental issue. This is a security issue. Um, when all of a sudden, if you wonder why it's like, why is climate change a global a national security issue? Uh, Navy bases for one. Um, and, yeah, our Navy bases will be literally underwater and. Most of our ships can't dive. Two, most people live within 600 miles of the coast. And uh, that's yeah. all of that gone. Yeah, because it destabilizes entire regions where people live. And when you destabilize a region where people live, anarchy happens. And then the military has to go in and deal with that. But we, have, we now have a military situation where we'd have to be everywhere at once. Which, technically... We do have the power to do because of our oversized military industrial complex, but we would not be that. What would we be doing? Dealing with refugees. Yeah. And putting down riots. Yeah. We would have to. Is that what we want to do? Is that what we want to go down in history as as being? Uh, 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 Shooting people because they were, they were homeless because the water rose. That's what we'd have to do. Yeah. Um, because at, at at the point where things are starting to go, starting, I mean, Micronesia is disappearing. Mm-hmm. We already have that. We already have refugees from a nation that is starting to disappear. Yeah. A couple of others, too. Yeah. Again. The Maldives. The Mal- Maldives, another, another example. But um, Venice is ending up underwater. Okay, a, a, a cultural heritage site to the world. Yeah, well, we're, we're kind of used to Venice being underwater. Yeah, but not entirely underwater. No, not entirely. That's um, it, it, It's to a point where now the streets are flooding on a regular basis. People are having to change their homes. People are fleeing their country. You think we have a refugee problem with Syria? No. Soon we're going to have a global refugee problem. Oh, yeah. And what countries are going to be able to take these people in? What countries are going to be able to handle that level of displacement? It's, it's, it's not able to. It's willing to. At this point... None of them are willing to even deal with a minor crisis like Syria. And yeah, I said minor. On purpose. (laughs) Yeah. No, we're going to be looking at more and more people displaced because of a man-made cataclysm. Yeah. Okay. Well, and on that uh, that cheerful note... um, yeah, I don't think there's anything more that we can say about that. No, it's, nope, it's, that's science. That's that's science. <laughs> and if you've enjoyed what we do here and you'd like to help us out, there are four ways. You can donate to the show through patreon.com slash radio and get early access to the full show content. Uh, you can also review us on iTunes, which helps gain audience for the show. You can tell someone about us. That always helps. Just word of mouth advertising. It's fantastic. And of course, you can engage with us directly and send us a message on social media or the electronic mail at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, there's 470-222-6759. It's always ready to take your call or text. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time with us. Uh, with us this evening. Uh, This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3 United States license, with the exception of the music created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com, who holds the copyright thereto.